she alleged and we had the obligation to establish that there was an objectively reasonable expectation that she would suffer great bodily injury or death and that knowing what she knew about Douglas ben Benefield, the force used was reasonable. The strange case of a former ballerina who allegedly shot and killed her husband is taking a step closer to trial. Professor of law Jules Epstein sits down with me to discuss this roller coaster of a case. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Well, a Florida murder case has taken center stage, and it is that of former model and ballerina Ashley Benefield. Now, Ashley is accused of shooting and killing her husband, Doug Benefield, inside of their Lakewood Ranch house in Florida back in September of 2020. Now, Ashley's defense team filed a motion for dismissal as she claims that Doug was an abusive husband and she shot and killed him in self-defense. Now, that motion was denied, and Ashley Benefield has entered a not guilty plea. And I should tell you that at the time of this recording, her stand your ground hearing in front of a judge is currently going on. And we're going to explain what that hearing means in a minute. But first, let's get into some background of the case. So let's rewind to 2016. Ashley was at a Republican fundraiser in Palm Beach, Florida. Now, she was only 24 years old at the time. She had actually worked as Donald Trump's campaign office in his campaign office in Sarasota, Florida. And at this fundraiser is where she meets recently widowed 54 year old Navy veteran Doug Benefield. You notice how I said recently. So before Ashley, Doug's first wife, Renee Benefield, died just nine months prior from an undiagnosed heart condition. Now, I want to be very clear because I don't know if a lot of you thought this or were speculating. Doug has never been charged in connection with his wife's death. There is no evidence whatsoever that he was involved in his wife's death. I want to make that very, very clear. Well, apparently, Doug and Ashley are smitten when they meet, despite their 30-year age difference. And just two weeks after meeting, they marry. Now, one note about their wedding is that no one was invited, not even Doug's 15-year-old daughter, Eva. According to Doug's cousin, Doug didn't even tell Eva that he was getting married. So Doug, I should tell you also, was a technology consultant, and he had started several businesses. And it just so happens that his new wife wanted to start her own ballet company. So with the help of Doug, Ashley launched the American National Ballet in Charleston, South Carolina. But this company failed. This business failed. It and it failed pretty quickly. And the relationship between the two soured, with Ashley ending up living with her mother while she was pregnant with Doug's baby. And what Ashley accused Doug of, we'll get into more of that in a minute. But Ashley did eventually give birth in March of 2018. And it was so bad between her and Doug, she not only didn't put his name down on the birth certificate, she didn't tell him that she gave birth. It would be months before he even saw his daughter with the help of a court. So they wound up actually getting back together. They worked on their differences. But then on September 27th, 2020, that is when everything changes. Ashley Benefield shot and killed Doug Benefield. And this happened while Doug and Ashley were alone in her home after they were preparing to move to Maryland. He was going to move to Maryland, but live separately from them. They were trying to work it out. Now, their daughter was out with Ashley's mother at the time of the shooting. The police dispatchers received a 911 phone call from a man who said his neighbor had just run over to his home yelling for help, that she had just shot her husband because he attacked her. That neighbor was identified as Ashley Benefield. So Ashley wasn't arrested until November 5th, 2020, a little over a month after Doug's death. And she's charged with second degree murder with a firearm and faces a minimum sentence of 25 years to life in prison. Now, you have to hear this. After being charged with the crime, the judge set a bond of $100,000 and Ashley was able to pay it. So now she has a court issued curfew. She's required to wear an ankle monitor. She lives with her mother and her now five-year-old daughter. Court documents show that she's been able to adjust her curfew at times when needed. She's even been able to travel to a wedding in Maryland at one point. There's a lot to get into here. And before I get into any of the details regarding the investigation and the evidence of the case, I want to bring on a very special guest, fan favorite, 
from us here at the show and also from our viewers and listeners. I'm joined right now by Professor Jules Epstein. Professor Epstein is the Edward D. Allbound Professor of Law and Director of Advocacy Programs at Temple University Beasley School of Law. And he joins us now. Professor, so good to see you. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Let's get into the law. Let's start there. So Ashley Benefield was in court for a pretrial hearing, and it is centered upon the stand your ground defense in Florida. Let's start there. What is a stand your ground hearing? What does stand your ground law mean? So stand your ground is a form of self-defense. In many states, there's what's called a duty to retreat. Even if I am in fear of you, let's say you have a knife, if I can back away safely, I have to do that. I can't stand my ground and then use deadly force. Florida and other states have a stand your ground law, which is even if I could avoid the problem completely, if I am legally where I am, I went to the corner to buy a newspaper and you're coming at me and I could turn around, I can stand my ground and then, and the terms are, if I am in fear of imminent death or imminent great bodily harm, I may use deadly force. If she can convince a judge that this was stand your ground and it applies, what does that mean? The case is over? Florida has what's called an immunity provision. You are immune, protected from prosecution. Um, it's going to be a little weird with can she convince the judge because the law is actually so protective of the person who claims self-defense that if she raises what's called a prima facie case and on the surface of it claim this was self-defense, the government has to prove that it wasn't self-defense, not beyond a reasonable doubt but by the very high level of what's called clear and convincing evidence. So she doesn't have to prove much. She has to make what I'd call, and forgive me if this is legal jargon a little, a colorable, a facially plausible claim. I was in fear, and I'm going again, of imminent, meaning in that moment, death or imminent great bodily harm. Now, let's be clear. Even if she's to lose this hearing, and by that I mean this trial, this case progresses to a trial, she can still assert a self-defense argument in front of a jury. How is that going to look different than arguing stand your ground? I think she, part of it is still arguing stand your ground, but she'll be arguing it to a jury, not to the judge here. It's, it's almost a two bites at the apple approach. I think yep. the idea here is that Florida says we're so protective of people's right to self-defense. We don't want the expense of a trial. We don't want the months and months of agony of waiting for a trial. We're going to let a judge do an early review. That's my yeah. lay explanation of what an immunity hearing is. Let's get rid of the case if she is really immune but she always has the right to ask a jury, even if the judge says, I don't buy it. Well, now let's get into some of the details that might help or not help a self-defense or stand your ground claim. So according to court documents, Ashley apparently tried to do everything she could to keep Doug away from their baby. She even filed domestic violence claims in court. Supposedly, Doug had once fired a gun into the ceiling during an argument with Ashley. I believe it was like right before their wedding. She claims that Doug tried to poison her at one point. So if these domestic claims are true, if Doug was in fact abusive to Ashley, how does that factor into the case and maybe ultimately the judge or the jury's decision? Okay. Um, when we are deciding if a person acted in self-defense, Part of it is objective. Look at the facts neutrally. Part of it is subjective. What's reasonably in her mind? Well, if my spouse, and I'm not saying he did this, but if my spouse had 
shot a gun in front of me. I think another one was like punched the dog in the face. We'll put aside the poison thing. That says that explains why I could be fearful of him so that on that night in that house, when he came at me and pushed me and smacked me with a box and took his fist like that towards my head, it wasn't those acts in isolation, but in a context of a history. So that's so important. You have to understand what the backstory was. So even in, if you were just to look at whatever the actions were on the night in question, and we'll get to it in a second, you can't look at it in isolation because it might look relatively benign to somebody, but looking at it in the context of the full history, that's something the jury could consider. Absolutely. Now, let's talk about this. We don't know if it's true. The ceiling story may be true. According to Doug's family attorney, she said that I'm, Doug I'm, once did discharge the gun into the ceiling Doug of the house. That. Doug admitted that in a deposition yep. based on he, what I've read. His spin is different. It's okay. I lost my cool. I shot into the air, but that's it. Right. But now yes, his, his friend, it. his friend, though, Trip Cormany, if I'm saying his name right, said that Doug was filled with regret over what happened. So apparently it did happen, but maybe the reasoning behind it or what prompted it is, is there's a difference there. Now, I do want your opinion on this. At this injunction hearing, the judge went on the record and said that this poisoning story did not possess a scintilla of truth as laid right. out by Ashley. What do you think about that? Okay. Um, I think about it as a human, as a citizen, and as a law professor. As a human, I'm saying, okay, something smelled really bad to this judge. Um, and sadly, because I want to be clear, I think most of the time when people go to court seeking an injunction or what in some states we call a protection order, they don't do it out of spite. They go because there's fear. If a judge who's appropriately sensitive says, well, I'm sorry, this is so unbelievable, I can't stand it. You would have to say there's a question mark here. As a lawyer, it becomes really interesting because under the rules of evidence, I'm not sure that that judge's opinion, hey, I don't believe you, belongs in a trial in another case. And then we're in this weird world of it's not exactly a trial, it's an immunity hearing. But the tiny bit of it that I watched on Law and Crime this morning seemed to say all this stuff was coming in. Mm. Um, so it may also be that you live by the sword, you die by the sword. What do I mean? That Ashley's defense team is making all these claims that may make fair response for the prosecutor to say, sure, but when you took it to a judge, they went like this. They said <laughs> it's <laughs> right. So uh, this is laying it all out. OK, well, I'm glad you mentioned that because this is the defense's theory of what happened that night, which is what I imagine they're going to argue it. This I, we saw this from their motion to dismiss. Here's what they say happened. I'm just going to lay it out and then I want your what you think about this, if this will rise to the level of a self-defense claim. So they say Doug allegedly became angry, screaming, we are moving together as a family, making a fresh start. And you're but you're dividing us. And it's time you start acting like a wife. Remember, they were going to be moving together uh, to Maryland. Later, Doug allegedly drove a moving box directly into Ashley in an upward motion, resulting in considerable pain and scratches to her right side. Ashley tried to, now there is a debate about whether she actually had injuries or not. Police say they couldn't find anything. Her attorneys apparently ex showed evidence that she did have bruises. And then Ashley tries to leave the home, but Doug allegedly grabs her by the left hand, yanked her backward, and asked her where she was going. He's accused of wagging his finger in her face, stating, you can't leave me. Ashley snapped, yelled at him to leave, raising his right hand with a closed fist. He drove his knuckles at the second joint into the left side of her head. Her worst fears realized she, now Ashley believed her life was in danger and she opened fire. What do you think about that? If those are the facts as laid out by the defense. So my first question is how they're going to prove that. And so let yep. me back up slightly because she has the right 
to remain silent at this hearing. On the other hand, anything that's the old, anything you say can and will be used against you. If she testifies at the immunity hearing, her words can then be admitted against her at trial if the judge doesn't throw it out. So what decision she will make, I don't know. So I'm still scratching my head. This is her story. She's the only person in the house who's going to tell it. But assuming it can be told, it comes down to a decision of the following. And you talked before about context, okay? Uh, if you're over at my house and I grab you, then you can't leave and I hit you once upside the head, okay? Is that enough to make you fear death? Is that enough to make you fear, I'm going back to the statute, great bodily harm? Maybe the second, especially if there is indeed this context that you and I don't have in our friendship, right? I haven't shot a gun at, in front of you into the ceiling. Um, and I will say, because I've worked over the years on cases with battered person's defense, as you put it, what might seem fairly minor to you or to me can be the beginning, the signal of the, the volcanoes about to erupt in a battering relationship. But that's if that's what was going on here. I think some of the problems that her case faces are number one, this whole dispute. I have a box banged into my side. Well, the police photo shows a day or two old scratch on her. And there's somebody who said, oh, she got that a day or two earlier. There's a picture of a black eye, but I can't tell when it's from. So I don't know what that means. It's, I found it interesting. I'm not sure this is admissible that by the time the police got there that night, her lawyer was on the scene. And of course, she's not talking to anybody. Who called the lawyer? How quickly? What was going on there? I'm not sure what inference, good, bad, or neutral, should be drawn from that. Um, and then, if she doesn't have bruises corroborating this, um, then the question is, does that story ring true? If it does, I think a judge could give her the benefit of fear of great bodily harm. I'm not sure they have to. And the government's job here is going to say, wait a minute, take a look where the guy is shot and please help me out here. But my memory from reading all the news reports is he Le shot leg yeah. and sort of in the side as if turning away from her. That's my next point. So first, you make a great point that either a judge or a jury is going to have to accept the facts laid out by the defense. And then if they accept those facts, to determine whether or not it amounts to a self-defense claim. But you mentioned where he was shot and how many times he was shot. This I find to be the central question. She fired four shots. Two of them hit him. When one went through his right leg from the side and the other through the side of his ribs, the prosecution is claiming that he wasn't facing Ashley when she shot him. So that's a really important point that if she shot him in the back or while he was turned away, how on earth can you claim self-defense unless, of course, he was turning to grab something or he was turning to roundhouse and punch her? That's the only thing that makes sense to me, Professor. I, and so that's the whole issue. You're exactly right. If we only took where the bullet entered in isolation, that raises a great concern. It's not, I am shooting as they're coming right at me, right? Dead on in the chest. Okay. There's some turning. I would be very curious to have an independent forensic expert or a forensic pathologist say, what are the different positions a body could be in? Number two, I can be swinging at you and turn sideways slightly, right, before I'm going to swing again. So I'm not sure how much you can read into that, although it certainly isn't the most helpful fact for her. We're in this closed house, right, close quarters. 
Um, but she sure cannot say he was coming at me with the sledgehammer over his head. She said he postured like a mixed martial artist, basically claiming that was why he was shot in the side of the body. And then there was something I read in one of the reports where the government is claiming that the position is inconsistent with mm. some sort of aggressive or menacing attitude again. When I read things like that, I, my general reaction is, wait a minute. There are too many ways a body can move, and I would like to see some martial artists move in 20 <laughs> positions, and, and we keep shooting them with a paint gun, right? Something yeah. to, I'm not convinced of that unless I really learn the credentials of the person who's saying that and whether they actually tested it. It's easy yeah. for me to say, oh, that's inconsistent. But have you tried standing that way? Have you tried standing that yeah. way and measured? So, Professor, before we let you go, I want to ask you real quick. We have about a minute left. She's charged with second degree murder, not first degree murder. I mean, I don't think this is they're arguing it was premeditated or deliberated upon or planned. But is could one of her best uh, strategies be if she can't get this uh, a not guilty verdict, if this goes to a trial to maybe get it reduced to manslaughter? Is that a possibility? So forgive me, I didn't research Florida law on that, but in many no states, worries. there's something we called imperfect self-defense. And that often reduces murder to manslaughter, where we're saying you didn't go in with a cruelness and evil disposition, but you misassessed the circumstances. You over-responded, but you're not malicious. Um, and yeah. so here's what would happen real quick. Um, her lawyers, assuming this went to trial, would have to make a decision or two. One is, do they ask the judge when you charge the jury, do you make sure to include that lesser charge? Some lawyers say, no, I want an all or nothing because I'm bold and I don't think any juror is going to give her the all. So I want the not guilty. Some are more conservative saying, I want that, I want that, you know, safety valve, that protection. Yep. And that's what we'll have to wait and see how they play it. Professor Jules Epstein, I'd love to have you back on as this case progresses and we see whether or not she uh, will be able to survive the uh, uh, standard ground hearing and what transpires from that. But if this case ultimately does progress, we'd love to have you on. Thank you so much for your insight. I know I appreciated it and I'm sure our viewers and listeners will too. Well, thank you for allowing real discussion at a real deep level of what are some complicated and important legal issues. I agree, sir. Thank you again. All right, everybody. That is all we have for you right now here on Sidebar. Thank you so much for joining us. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time.